This is Missoula and the campus of the University of Montana, a terrific setting in the Rocky Mountains and ground zero for much of the water for the Ice Age floods of the Pacific Northwest. Let's tell the story in a nutshell and then explore old shorelines, high energy gravel deposits, and delicate silt beds that all tell the incredible story of Glacial Lake Missoula. During the Ice Age, the valleys of western Montana were filled with 1,000 feet of fresh water. Glacial Lake Missoula formed due to an ice dam in northern Idaho, the Purcell Trench Lobe, that blocked the Clark Fork River and its tributaries across the border in Montana. The ice dam area, which we know today as Lake Ponderé, was 2,000 feet high, 30 miles long, and sealed off a mountain valley creating a backup of lake water 200 miles to the east. Like filling a bathtub with the drain plugged. A massive lake with long fjord-like arms. A southern arm that sat in the Bitterroot Valley to Hamilton below Trapper Peak. An eastern arm to Drummond. A northern arm into the Mission Valley and the Mission Range. As the water deepened behind the dam, the pressure built against the ice sheet. Eventually, the ice was no match for the massive volume of water in the lake. The dam failed quickly. The lake drained quickly, just a few days, to drain and rush over the floors of the Clark Fork River and Flathead River Valley. The water barreled over eastern Washington, leaving deep cuts in the desert and moving tons of rock from the Rocky Mountains into Washington and Oregon. And that was one Missoula flood. But it happened again at least twice, probably dozens of times, possibly as many as 100 times. The Purcell Ice Dam reformed, another glacial lake Missoula, and a new Ice Age flood burst through Idaho when the lake reached a critical depth. Rinse and repeat. The floods took different routes based on their size and local conditions. In the channeled scablands of eastern Washington, thick deposits of loess, wind-blown silt, were swept away. A surprising amount of basalt bedrock was removed by the Missoula floods, leaving impressive box-shaped canyons like the Grand Coulee with dry falls, fields of giant current ripples, huge potholes drilled into the bedrock. My God, how big were these floods? Regardless of size, each flood put on its brakes at Wallula Gap as the water funneled through the narrow gateway to the Columbia River Gorge. That was Lake Lewis in southern Washington, a brief delay before the now dirty brown water continued on through the Columbia River Gorge and on to the Pacific Ocean. Okay, that's the story. It's almost impossible to believe, right? What can we find in western Montana to prove that Glacial Lake Missoula really existed? Let's start with the obvious. Ancient shorelines, strand lines, benches on the hillsides created by wind blowing across the surface of the old lake. Tells us the water was a thousand feet deep here. But there's not just one old shoreline, there are dozens of them. Different lake levels. For the Montana valleys that had Glacial Lake Missoula in them, the old shorelines are best seen on northwest facing slopes. Like the hillside, above the University of Montana. The Big M, above campus, 620 feet above the town of Missoula. This is only two-thirds the way to the top, the high water mark. The highest strand line is more than 300 feet above us. Hiking up this slope, you might expect real obvious notches, benches, cuts, dug into this slope, but they're subtle. These old shorelines are more obvious from a distance than hiking right on top of them. T.C. Chamberlain was the first geologist to note these faint watermarks in 1886. He had read reports describing Scotland's parallel roads of Glen Roy and correctly interpreted the elevated shorelines here in Montana. 
Each glacial Lake Missoula strand line was created by lake waves eroding into the hillsides. But shorelines are also places of deposition. Beach gravels have been found, little beach berms. So far, no preserved organic carbon or other datable materials have been found at the old shorelines. So telling a decent story here is difficult. Missoula, the Big M, above campus, the strand lines on the hillside. Even though we don't have specific dates, most geologists agree that the highest strand line is the oldest lake. That the strand lines get younger as you go down the hill. The thinking is, if there was a young lake up here, and then you drain the lake, wouldn't you wipe out all these older strand lines? That's the thinking. Older, highest, younger, lowest. Yes, that's the thinking, but without datable material, even the most basic questions remain. Is each level a different glacial lake Missoula? Or is this one lake with periodic lowering? or a combination of the two somehow? Without dates for each shoreline, it's still unclear. The highest strand line is at 4,200 feet elevation. On a steep hill slope, exposed to more than 10,000 years of thunderstorms, it's pretty amazing how little eroded these strand lines are. At its maximum, Glacial Lake Missoula had a surface area of 3,000 square miles. The northern shorelines of the lake sometimes had an ice margin. Ice calved off into the lake. Icebergs with big rocks in them that set sail for various destinations in the lake. Large boulders show where the big rocks fell off their ice rafts. Drop stones, back when the water of Glacial Lake Missoula was relatively calm and quiet. Up north, impressive white lake beds were laid down close to the ice margin. Rock flower, silts created from the grinding power of the ice sheet to the north. Wildlife and dusty white deposits everywhere. The drain was plugged, the lake was big, and the white silts collected on the quiet lake floor. But there are also deposits that speak of tremendous high-energy events. Mud is usually at the bottom of lakes, right? You swim in your favorite lake, that means dark mud is oozing up between your toes. But at the bottom of much of glacial Lake Missoula, deposits of rocks, not mud, dominates on the valley floors below the strand lines. Why? I'll bet you know why, right? High energy water is recorded in these valley bottoms. That's what the rocks are telling us. But when Glacial Lake Missoula was here, it wasn't high energy, it was low energy. The water's just sitting there and layers of mud and silt are being deposited at the bottom. But when we break the ice dam, that water starts moving quickly, fast enough to erode all those soft beds at the bottom. And in their place, a big batch of river gravels were brought in from elsewhere and sit at the bottom, deposited during the high velocity flooding. Rocks the size of my fist or my head are even bigger. So when we look down the guts of the Clark Fork River Valley, it's high energy river gravels in the bottom instead of the mud. Okay, make another ice dam, make another lake, lay down more silts and muds. That's fine. But when we break that ice dam, the water's on the move and we erase those and bring in more river gravels. All told, we have more than 300 feet of big flood deposited gravels at the bottom of the Clark Fork River Valley. How many floods does this represent? Under the tranquil scene of trees and flowers, the marbles from high-energy floods. The fastest water probably peaked in the first few hours during the ice dam collapse. The high-energy gravels are piled thick in places where the water slowed right after being shot through narrow valley bottlenecks. A giant flood bar at Tarkio, hundreds of feet high and more than a mile long, is composed of fist-sized rocks. In other places, water speeds were fast enough to pluck car-sized boulders 
from very hard bedrock. Not enough to convince you? Still not sure that Glacial Lake Missoula drained in a hurry? Well, how about these? Giant current ripples formed on the lake floor as the lake drained quickly. At Camas Prairie, individual ripples are 35 feet high and spaced 100 feet apart. Cobbles and pebble gravel shaped into these impressive forms that developed under more than 200 feet of water moving up to 60 miles per hour. Joseph Pardee was the first to study these more than 75 years ago. Four sets of ripples sit below four separate spillways above Camas Prairie. Western Montana's bedrock is different than Washington's flood-scoured basalt. Glacial Lake Missoula sat in sedimentary bedrock created more than one billion years ago. It's pretty easy to visualize where the lake rushed out of Montana. Today's Clark Fork River flows in the direction that the Missoula floods flowed. Rugged, vertical-walled canyons like Eddy Narrows were particularly energetic spots for the flood water. Pockets of flood gravels remain stranded high and dry inside canyons. Gulch fills help show the depth and the speed of the water as it ran the gauntlet downstream to Idaho, Washington, and beyond. The deepest glacial lake Missoula was just a few hundred feet shy of spilling over the Bitterroot Mountains at Lookout Pass, where Interstate 90 crosses the Idaho-Montana state line. Instead, the lake drained through the Bitterroots using existing river valleys to the north, and once into Idaho, the flood swung to the southwest over Spokane and the broad openness of eastern Washington. So much field evidence for Glacial Lake Missoula is visible from I-90 between St. Regis and Missoula. At the exit for Nine Mile Road, one more very important study site. These are famous silty beds west of Missoula, partly because we're still debating the significance of them. These are rhythmites. There's 40 of them here. With that zebra striping, what's the story? Why are these delicate silts still here if this is a place where high energy flood water was cruising through? These repetitive layers of silt and mud contain details with important clues. But debate continues on what these layers are telling us about Glacial Lake Missoula's history. Even the terms are confusing. Rhythmites, varves, are they the same thing? Not here at Nine Mile. Interstate 90, from the freeway, you can see the rhythmites. Dark, light, dark, light. From the freeway, those are the zebra stripes. But within one dark zebra stripe, varves, at a tinier scale. Dark, light, dark, light. Those are annual patterns dark light couplet that's one winter summer pattern varves rhythmites many geologists see the more than 500 varv couplets here as annual layers like counting tree rings in the mud but not everybody agrees that these tiny layers are annual why not seasonal storms they say or occasional debris flows into the bottom of the lake but the tiny layers are so clean, some people say. Not a root, not a leaf, not a twig, not a gopher hole, no tracks, no cut and fill gullies, very little organic carbon. At least everybody can agree that dark zebra strikes, the dark rhythmites, were deposited at the bottom of Glacial Lake Missoula. The dark bands are mud, the light bands are silt, and the rhythmites get thinner and thinner toward the top. But that's it for agreement. What do the light-colored silty rhythmites really tell us? Do they record lake drainings or lake fillings? The nine-mile rhythmites sit on top of the high-energy gravels that we talked about earlier. It's looking like the coarse gravels, not these delicate rhythmites, are the record for the truly huge floods, the big drainings of Glacial Lake Missoula. But how many big floods? It's pretty tough to tease out individual huge floods from a big pile of marbles. 
With so much water speed, it seems unlikely that these soft beds would survive, especially since they sit in the area's most deeply scoured canyon stretches. Are these beds at nine mile from the last and smallest glacial lake Missoula? Almost an afterthought in the Ice Age flood story? A progressively smaller Lake Missoula toward the end of the Ice Age is consistent with these rhythmites that progressively thin up section and have decreasing numbers of varves per zebra stripe as you head up the slope. And that agrees with the strand lines getting lower and lower with time above Missoula. Each successive thinning ice dam existed for less years, resulting in a lower ancient shoreline. Flood magnitudes must have decreased through time, but did each dam collapse completely with each big flood? Or was there a slower release of water that somehow tunneled through the ice sheet? Did each glacial lake Missoula drain completely? Are partial lake drains even possible? It's tempting to correlate the rhythmites of glacial lake Missoula with northern Washington's glacial lake Columbia and southern Washington's Lake Lewis. Are these the same beds? Is each rhythmite from a major Missoula flood from Montana? Was each flood from Montana? Are there other potential sources of water to the north? Bed for bed correlation is almost impossible due to differences in the character of the sediments. The varved muds at the bottom of Glacial Lake Columbia show many, many years of lake water due to the Columbia River being blocked by the Okanagan ice sheet a different plug, a different bathtub. And at the bottom of Lake Lewis in southern Washington, no varves at all. The lake down there lasted just a few days at a time. That bathtub had an open drain, Wallula Gap. Emerging dates do seem to suggest that some of the huge floods struck earlier in the Ice Age. We just don't have enough dates to tell a more complete story. Not yet, anyway. Answers will come from the next generation of field geologists. New dates are trickling in. Surface exposure dating techniques are being used now on basalt bedrock and coulee walls and on the surfaces of erratics sitting in Washington's channeled scablands. As more dates emerge from across the Ice Age floods country, some of the mysteries that remain will be solved about Glacial Lake Missoula. Ideally, with new techniques used by future geologists, new dates will come from the floor of the old lake and maybe even from the strand lines up high above Missoula. Glacial Lake Missoula, where it all began and where unsolved mysteries still remain.